In his effort to uh, encourage the Ephesian church to strive for unity and peace in the spirit, Paul reminds them that the basis for this unity, the fact that they equally share the body of Christ in the present, they share a similar past, which was their calling to Christ through the gospel, and they also share a similar future or hope of heaven, something uh, that Kendall was talking about uh, during his uh, communion uh, devotional. He also mentions, Paul does, also mentions that they all have together confessed the same Lord, believed the same teaching, the faith, and received or experienced the same one baptism. Now, we can understand that the one Lord is Jesus and the one faith is the teaching about Jesus as the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins and was resurrected on the third day, but why would Paul, or the Holy Spirit for that matter, why would Paul insist on including baptism in this equation? I get the one Lord, I get the one faith, but why, why does he mention the one baptism? I believe that the one baptism reference was included because at that time there were many baptisms as well as many reasons for baptism. And so in my lesson this morning I'd like to define the one biblical baptism that Paul is talking about here and the many purposes that the New Testament gives for its administration. So by the time someone who is reading the Bible gets to the book of Acts chapter two, and reads about Peter's Pentecost Sunday sermon and the tremendous response you know, when 3,000 people come forward and are baptized, that person has read about several types of baptisms and water rituals, not only among the Jews, but the pagans as well. So there were a lot of baptisms at the time that this was written. For example, the pagan religions. Pagans purified themselves with fire, with incense, with blood, but their most common purification ritual was with water. For example, water purification was required by those who were initiated into the mysteries of Isis, the Egyptian goddess, female goddess of nature and magic. The Greeks had special priests called the Cathartai, and what they did is they specialized in water purification rites. And so baptism or immersion in water as a symbol of purification was not exclusively a Jewish thing or a Christian thing, it was used by pagans as well at that time. Secondly, you had the ritual washing of the Jews. Remember what I'm talking about now, all the different kind of water things going on at the time that Ephesians was written. So you had the ritual washing of the Jews. The Jews, however, had been using water in their purification rites for at least 1,500 years before Christ. There was the ceremonial washing commanded by God of Aaron and his sons before they put on the sacred garments of the priesthood and began their priestly duties. Read about that in Leviticus chapter eight, verses five to seven. There were also the ritual washings or the ablutions. There was a full body immersion in a mikvah. A mikvah was a bath. Okay. which was the forerunner of today's baptistry. This was required in situations where a person was considered impure. For example, a woman after a menstrual period or a new convert to Judaism would be baptized in a mikvah, a purification rite with water in order uh, to uh, return to a pure status required for entry into the temple. Um, in the New Testament, there are several references to the ceremonial washing of hands and utensils by the Pharisees. Mark chapter seven, verse, 14, or verse four, for example. So the people of Jesus' time, as well as pagans, were familiar with the concept of water purification rituals of various kinds. Then you have another baptism, significant one, the baptism of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is unique among the prophets for several reasons. First of all, he broke the silence that had existed for four centuries since the time of Malachi, the previous prophet through whom God spoke. 
Uh, he is also the last of the Old Testament prophets arriving and ministering before the new covenant was established by Christ. Uh, he was chosen to be the one who proclaimed that the long awaited Messiah who was spoken of in the past by other prophets was finally here. The other prophets said, one day in the future the Messiah uh, will come. But when John the Baptist showed up, he said, no, 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 now, he's here now, he's coming, it's imminent. So he was the one that did that. He also, and here's interesting, here, this is an interesting part, he also married the message of the coming of the Messiah and his kingdom with the requirement to repent and be baptized. As a prophet, he was the first to marry those two concepts together. He also previewed the fulfillment of God's plan to redeem men from sin through faith. In the coming of the Messiah, Jesus expressed in repentance and baptism. It was a new response to God that replaced the old system of animal sacrifice and mediation by the priests and the leaders of the temple. In the past, those who wanted to come to God had to come through the Jewish system. And in the Jewish system, a man, for example, had to be circumcised, he had to be baptized, he had to, you know, he had to offer sacrifice, and then he was placed among God's people. But now John the Baptist comes along and he says, no, no, it's a new system now. Those who are coming to God, they need to repent. Yes, they need to be baptized, but there's no longer any necessary uh, sacrifice. The sacrifice is going to be offered by Jesus. And then there's another baptism, again, that people were aware of at that time, and that was the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Aside from the water baptism that he called on people to receive, John also spoke of a baptism with the Holy Spirit that the Messiah would administer when he came. And I think it's important to read this passage. He says, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Matthew chapter three, verse 11. So as a prophet, John was signaling that the promises made by the earlier prophets, like Joel, for example, Joel chapter 2, 28 to 32, who said that one of the things that would accompany the arrival of the Messiah was a greater manifestation of the Holy Spirit's presence and power. So in previous times, the Holy Spirit would empower select individuals like prophets and kings and judges and he'd give them certain abilities and power and great faith in order to do God's work. The promise of the prophets was that when the Messiah would come, not only a precious few would have the Spirit for a short amount of time to render special service, no, no, no. When the Messiah came, everyone would receive the Spirit of God and have Him all of the time. Some would do signs and wonders and you know, they would be empowered to do those things, but everybody would receive the Spirit and the Spirit would stay with them. We, we don't understand when we read Acts 2.38, we usually concentrate on the baptism part and the water part, which is fine, but the people who were actually hearing the message of Peter uh, understood that the promise of the prophets that one day they would all receive the Spirit equally, that promise was about to be fulfilled. So we see this prophecy fulfilled in the book of Acts in two ways. First, in, uh, the, the apostles and many disciples received empowerment through the Holy Spirit to perform miracles in the service of the gospel. So we see examples of that, people empowered to you know, lay hands on people and, 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 and heal them or speak in tongues. So we see that kind of empowerment. And then in Acts 2, 14 to 21, Peter even explains that the miracle of tongues that he and the other apostles were performing was actually a fulfillment of those promises made in the Old Testament about the Spirit. And also in Acts 2, 38, in his preaching, Peter insists that Jesus is the Messiah and those who believe this and repent of their sins and are baptized or are immersed in His name will be forgiven their sins. Yes, that wasn't a new message. You know, John had been preaching that, repent, be baptized, forgive. You know, that wasn't a new message. 
The new message was, and they will receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, thus fulfilling the prophecy that He would be poured on all of the people, both great and small, men, women, rich, poor, slave, free, everybody was to receive the Spirit of God. So John the Baptist combined his preaching about the coming of the kingdom and the Messiah with a call to repent and be baptized. Now I want to make a note about the form of baptism here, just so that it's clear. Throughout history there has been a debate about the form of baptism. Three forms have been practiced. All right? Three forms have been practiced. Immersion in water, pouring with water, you know, a little receptacle of water being poured over the head of the individual, and sprinkling with water. Usually babies are sprinkled with water. Each of these methods have a specific Greek word used to describe them. For example, to pour, the Greek word ekcheo, means to pour out. That's a specific word that describes a specific action. Uh, to sprinkle, reino, means to sprinkle. And then the word baptizo is to immerse, the immersion or to submerge. So you have a word that represents each different type of baptism that has been practiced. Now, when the New Testament mentions the word baptism, it is simply transliterating the Greek word baptizo into the English word baptize. Now stay with me here, there's a little bit of you know, language explanation. So if you were to literally translate John the Baptist's name, you would call him John the Immerser. Not John the Pourer or John the Sprinkler because they didn't use those Greek words to, uh, to describe him. They used the word baptizo. So whenever Jesus or the apostles called on their audience to respond to their message, they would encourage them to repent and be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. So if you were present in Jerusalem on Pentecost Sunday, those 2,000 years ago, you would have witnessed 3,000 people being immersed in the large pools of water that were present near the pilgrim gate where Peter preached his sermon. Now, some people will say, well, why do we use the word, why don't we just use immerse? Well, the reason the translators transliterated the word baptizo instead of translating it into the word immersion is because they did not want to offend the many religious denominations that had been using sprinkling and pouring as their mode of baptism for many years and whose support they needed to distribute their version of the Bible when it was finally printed. Some newer translations, however, the International English Bible, for example, now do not transliterate the word, they actually translate the Greek word, baptizo, into the correct English word using the word immerse. So that's a little sideline that I'm giving you here. If you wonder, what, what, you know, what's the debate about? Well, that's the debate. All right, so we've talked about four different you know, individuals, pagan religions, ritual washings, John the Baptist, baptism with the Holy Spirit. There's a fifth baptism and that's the baptism of Jesus. So during his ministry, Jesus more or less succeeded John's ministry and after John was executed, John's disciples then followed Jesus as John had instructed them. Jesus followed the form of John's ministry. What did he do? He preached, he immersed those who responded, However, the content and the authority of his message was different. He preached that the kingdom and the Messiah were here and those who wanted into the kingdom needed to be baptized. After his crucifixion and resurrection, he charged his apostles to continue this ministry of preaching and baptizing with the backing of his full authority. Matthew 28, 18, right? Uh, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So he, when he tells them go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he's saying I have the authority to give you the authority to go out and do this. So the fullness of the message was going to be preached. Forgiveness of sin, full indwelling of the Holy Spirit, membership into the kingdom or into the church, 
eternal life, all of these were offered to those who believed in Him and expressed that belief in repentance and full immersion in water. That's what we refer to as baptism in John 3, 16, Acts 2, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, and 42. Therefore, so I get to my point here. Therefore, when Paul the Apostle refers to the one baptism in Ephesians chapter four, verse five, he is confirming through inspired writing that despite the fact that his readers may be aware of several baptisms, they may be aware of the baptisms of the mystery religions, they may be conscious of the water rituals of the Jews, or the baptism of preparation preached by John, or the baptism with the Spirit fulfilled at Pentecost, there now remained only one baptism authorized by God, given by Jesus, and preached by the apostles. And that is full immersion in water done to express a person's sincere repentance and belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And this baptism leads to forgiveness and eternal life. So some people are now thinking, yeah, okay, great title, the baptism wheel. Where's the wheel? Well, here's the wheel. I'm always amazed when I hear someone ask if baptism is necessary for salvation, or does one have to be baptized in order to become a Christian? Based on what we have looked at this morning, the answer to that question is a resounding yes. John the Baptist, Jesus, and then the apostles all preached the necessity of baptism in the process of salvation. Otherwise, what would be the purpose of it? In the New Testament, baptism or immersion in water to express one's faith is always connected to salvation. But in the passages where baptism appears, the idea of salvation is described using different words and images. I have found that a, an effective way to convey this pattern of teaching is to use what I call the baptism wheel. You have a picture of that in your handouts there just to make it easy to follow along. Let me explain to you some of the, you know, some of the diagrams, some of the graphics here. The middle of the wheel, the focus of the wheel is salvation. That's where we want to get to, salvation. Okay? The spokes are the methods, are the way in to salvation. Right, the different reasons for salvation. And the blue part is the action of baptism. It's the access point of, uh, of salvation. So let's, uh, sh let me show you how this works. I'm going to read 10 passages very quickly, you will see, that are talking about salvation. That's the point of them. But they use different terms or images to describe salvation. But note the one thing that all of these passages will have in common, and that will be baptism. Shall we start? Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And I've already read this one. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Okay, so uh, how is salvation described here? Well, Jesus is describing it as becoming a disciple, because who else is saved? Is a disciple one who is saved? Well, of course. Can you be a disciple and not be saved? So salvation in Matthew 28 is described in terms of becoming a disciple. All right, let's keep moving. Mark 16, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Salvation in Mark 16, 16 is described as obedience, because this is a command. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Those who disbelieve will be lost. So it's obedience. So the ones who obey, they're the ones who are saved. Are they not? I mean, you know, if you've obeyed the gospel, you, you have salvation. You're one of those who have saved. What have you obeyed? Well, the command, believe and baptize, I, I'm saved. Another one, John 3. Jesus answered and said to him, to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter 
a second time um, into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So how is Jesus describing salvation here? Well, he's describing it as a born again experience. So who are the saved? Well, the ones who are born again by the water and the Spirit. Those are the ones who are saved. What water? Well, the water of baptism, that water. Another passage, Acts 2.38a, Peter said to them, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Are you getting with me now? How is salvation described here? Well, as forgiveness of sins. In other words, who, who are the saved? Well, the ones whose sins are forgiven. Those are the ones who are saved. I mean, if your sins are not forgiven, can you be saved? Well, of course not. If your sins are forgiven, aren't you the saved? So in Acts 2.38a, the Bible describes salvation, doesn't, doesn't mention the word salvation, it simply says the ones who are forgiven. Those are the ones who are saved. I keep going. Uh, Acts 2.38b, he says, uh, repent and be baptized, each of you in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of uh, sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How is salvation described here? Well, it's described in terms of the indwelling of the Spirit. Who are the saved? Well, the ones who have the Holy Spirit within them. Let's keep going. Another passage, Acts 22, 16. Now, why do you delay, Paul says, uh, excuse me, Ananias says to Paul, get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Wait a minute, how is salvation described here? Well, as those people whose sins are washed away, who are the saved? The ones who have their sins washed away. When do they get their sins washed away? Well, when they're baptized, another passage. Romans 6, 3, 4, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the death through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Who are the saved? Well, those who have been buried with Christ and resurrected with Christ. Those are the ones who are saved, right? How can you be buried with Christ and resurrect with Christ and be lost? Well, no, you're the saved. How are you buried with Christ? Well, in baptism, of course, another passage. Galatians 3.27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. How is salvation referred to here? Well, it's referred to as putting on Christ. Notice they never mention the word salvation. It's a metaphor, it's an image, it's a description, but it always means the same thing. It's always talking about Salvation. So how does Paul describe it in Galatians 3, 26 and 7? He describes salvation as putting on Christ. Who are the saved? Well, the ones who put on Christ. Where do they put on Christ? Well, in baptism, another passage. Colossians 2, 11 and 12, and in Him you were also circumcised, in Him, Christ, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. So how, does, how is salvation described here? Well, the ones who receive the circumcision of Christ. He cuts away the old man and the new man comes up, who are the saved, according to Colossians? Well, the ones who have received the circumcision of Christ. Where do they receive the circumcision of Christ? And when does this happen? Paul says it right in the same verse. Well, in baptism, that's where. Another passage. 1 Peter 3.21, the last passage. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, not just a purification rite, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So who are the saved? How is he describing salvation here? Well, the saved are the ones that have a clear conscience. And where is that conscience cleared? Well, in the waters of baptism. I mean, it's no stretch. They always mention baptism in every single one of these uh, passages. So let's draw a few conclusions here based on the 10 scripture, 10. In the Bible, one's enough, right? Two confirms. I've just given you 10 
I could give you more, but I figured you know, I've only got two hours. So <laughs> conclusions, A. Baptism is a key part in the process of salvation. I like to say process of salvation because salvation is a process. It began in Genesis, <laughs> through the Old Testament prophets, through Christ the Messiah coming and dying on the cross and the preaching of the gospel. It's a, it's a process. I've given 10 scripture references that deal specifically with salvation and in every single passage, baptism is central to the process. That's called context. That's biblical context. We know it is the sacrifice of Jesus that pays for our sins, not the act of baptism. It's not baptism that pays for my sins. Jesus did that on the cross. But God has given us baptism as the common physical expression of our faith when we confess Jesus and repent of our sins. Every single person throughout history who has believed that Jesus is the Son of God, has, the, has repented of their sins, have expressed that faith in baptism. Not by snapping their fingers, not by walking on coals, not by saying a bunch of words, by baptism. Why? Well, I've given you 10 examples from the New Testament that require it, that's why. So people may doubt baptism's role in salvation, but the Bible is crystal clear about its manner, immersion in water, and its purpose, the biblical expression of our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Conclusion number two. There is one baptism, yes, it's in the water, it's by immersion, based on our faith and repentance, yeah, that one baptism. But there are many reasons. A personal story. I was baptized in 1977, November. It was cold, there was no heat in the water. That's why I remember the date. <laughs> I accepted to be baptized because of Mark 16:16. 16, 16 because of Mark 16, 16. I had been baptized as a baby. I mean, I was Catholic, I was an altar boy, I was in seminary, so I was you know, fully sprinkled when I was a baby. I was even immersed once by a, by a group you know, because I wanted to be part of their group. But the more I studied the Bible, the more I understood that my baptism as a baby and the stuff that I had been doing before was not the baptism that was being described in the New Testament. I did believe and now I wanted to obey the Bible command. So as I say in November 77, I confessed my belief in Jesus, repented of my sins and I was immersed in response to His command. I tell you this story in order to make the following point. On the night I was baptized in obedience to Mark, I, re, I still remember uh, Jim Metter with his Bible open to Mark 16 and it was, did you do that? And I went, no, I didn't do that. And I want to go to heaven. I don't want to be, you know, and those who disbelieve are lost. I don't want to be lost. I want to go to heaven. I believe. He says, all right, what are you waiting for? So I was, you know, Mark 16, here's the thing. On the night that I was baptized, I was not aware that I would be receiving the Holy Spirit on that night also. I hadn't been taught that yet. Or that I was putting on Christ. Or that this was an appeal to God for a clear conscience. Or that I was being circumcised by Christ. You know, I didn't know any of those things. I simply understood and believed that those who obey Jesus, you know, believe and be baptized, they would be saved. And I wanted to be saved. Now, as I continued to study, I discovered that at baptism, I also became a disciple, was born again, received forgiveness and the Holy Spirit, washed away my sins, was buried and resurrected with Jesus, put on Jesus, received circumcision of Christ, appealed to God for a clear conscience. I found all those things out as I went along. I understood that the Bible describes salvation using many different terms and images, but it is always the same salvation and it is obtained in always the same way, faith, repentance, baptism. Now, I didn't have to be re-baptized every time I discovered a new feature 
or a new blessing connected to my salvation. I mean, I would have been baptized 10 times or more. And that brings me to my final conclusion. Salvation requires a biblical reason and a biblical baptism. You know, people sometimes question their salvation experience. Was I too young? Did I do it for the right reason? Here's what I counsel people to consider when this issue comes up. Ask yourself two questions. Number one, was I baptized for a biblical reason? I mentioned 10 biblical reasons in my sermon this morning, and there are probably others if you look for them. For example, the Philippian jailer asked what, what, what he had to do to be saved. The reason for his baptism is that he wanted salvation. Acts 16.25, what's interesting is that's the only passage there that actually mentions the word salvation. The others are, are metaphors and images for salvation. If what led you to baptism is biblical, then you have an acceptable and legitimate reason for your baptism. If on the other hand, the reason for your baptism cannot be supported biblically, for example, well, I was baptized, well, my parents brought me to be baptized when I was a baby. Well, you know, go through the New Testament, you will not find that as a biblical reason. Or you did it to please your parents, or you did it to please your husband, or your girlfriend, or your buddy, or it was your birthday, or everybody at camp did it. Everybody was doing it at camp. I figured, what a way to finish out a great camp week. And the girl I liked, she was baptized. I figured, you know. As sincere as those reasons might be, they are not biblical reasons. If you're not sure, just ask somebody to help you find out. Don't be afraid. It's too important to let something like that just float around in the air. In the event that you were immersed for a reason other than a Bible one, you should consider being rebaptized with the proper understanding of what you are doing. And there is a precedent for this in the Bible. It's, you'd think God thought of it in advance. It's amazing. He may have thought, you know what? I gave them, <laughs> I gave them 10 clear scriptures, but just in case it wasn't clear enough, I'll give them an example. So in Acts 19, Luke describes a situation where a dozen men at Ephesus were rebaptized by Paul because they had originally been immersed the proper way in preparation for the coming of the kingdom. That was John's baptism long after John was dead and gone. This reason, although a spiritual reason, although a sincere reason, was no longer a valid reason because John had died, Jesus had been on the cross and resurrected Jesus now, it was his baptism. Once Paul taught them more completely, they were rebaptized for a valid biblical reason. I don't read in the Bible where it says, you know, you guys meant well, so good enough. I don't read that, oh, close enough. I'll be back next year, when's your birthday? No, it's, you, know, uh, you know what a hassle it is to baptize 12 grown men? This is not about word games here or splitting hairs. It's about the willingness to humble oneself and obey God according to His word. Not our opinion, not how we feel, not how my mom used to think. Finally, the second question I encourage people to ask when they're not sure. I don't want to make you unsure. I want to make sure that if you're sure, you remain sure. <laughs> the other question is this. Was I baptized in a biblical way? This is the easier question to figure out since the Bible is very clear about the mode of baptism. First of all, the grammar, the Greek word in which the Bible was, uh, the New Testament rather, was originally written, the Greek word means to immerse. It doesn't mean to pour, to sprinkle, to splash, it means to immerse. The imagery also connects to, connected to baptism points to a burial. 
Romans chapter six, they were buried, we're buried with Christ. Is this buried? Is this buried? No, no, this, that's buried. The imagery and the history also confirms it. Archeologists working on early church buildings and meeting places find that in each place, the early New Testament churches had elaborate and well-decorated baptistries designed for full immersion baptism. They don't have, these, these archeologists, they don't have an ax to grind. They're not, quote, Church of Christ archeologists. Some of them are not even Christians. They just like archeology. span They like old things. You may have been baptized in a variety of ways, but if you have not been immersed in water, you have not received the baptism that Jesus Himself received. And to me, for me, that's the strongest argument there. <laughs> Jesus was immersed. Who am I to question? Who am I to change? And the one that He commanded, and it is the one that the apostles practiced in their ministry. So there may have been some confusion in the church when Paul penned his letter to the Ephesians. He wanted them to remain united and hold to the one body and spirit and hope and Lord and faith and baptism and God that they had initially been taught and believed. Much is different in our time and society, but we, like the Ephesians, must also maintain unity among ourselves and faithfulness in what we believe and what we teach. Today, just as in the first century, there are many different reasons and modes of baptism that are being taught and practiced. Our task, are we still New Testament Christians? Are we still restoration Christians? I mean, is, this, is that idea a dead thing or is that, you know, is that who we are? If we're New Testament Christians, our task is not to denounce or judge other people for what they teach and practice. God will do this in His good time. Our mission is to teach and practice the one baptism that Jesus, Peter, Paul, and all of the other apostles taught and administered. Now, if you want more information, I'm ready. I've got a handout three pages long that if you'd like to go down into the weeds for this kind of stuff, I'll be happy to provide you that information. In the meantime, if you have not received or if you have questions about the one biblical baptism mentioned in Ephesians 4, then I encourage you to come forward now if you know or if you have questions to contact myself or Mar any of the preachers, the minute, anyone here We'll be happy to study with you and answer any of your questions. My goal this morning was to just get us to think a bit, review, make sure that we are right with God because we have done what He has asked us to do in His work. If you have any reason to come forward at the moment, then we encourage you to do so now as we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement. Shall we stand, please?